London Airport. Down in the passenger list as Mr. and Mrs. Miller, a honeymoon couple arrive in Britain to face the biggest headline since Caxton set up in business. Yes, it's Marilyn Monroe arriving with her playwright husband, Arthur Miller. Flash bulbs were popping from every angle, but Marilyn had nothing to say for the microphone. By 1956, Miller had married Marilyn Monroe, although he had met her years before during one of his fruitless trips to Hollywood. Leaving California after their first meeting, Miller wrote, I knew I must flee or walk into a doom beyond all knowing. With all her radiance, she was surrounded by a darkness that perplexed me. Although it took several years before the two of them were finally together, it was always, for many outside observers, a relationship that remained a mystery. Didn't it seem unlikely to you, that sort of, uh, that, uh, that, that partnership, a partnership with Marilyn? Did it seem not unlikely, or did you just fall in love? No, with it didn't. It, see, it seemed there was an unlikely quality to it, sure, from a cultural point of view, if you want to call it that, but uh, in a way we were both trying to do the same thing which was, I was desperately trying all my life to uh, unify experience and myself in that experience. I tried to do it, as I mentioned earlier, in salesmen. There would be one figure, a unified figure with society, psychology, everything in one basket. Likewise, oneself, I thought, there should be a unity in yourself. And the, the very... Uh, inappropriateness of our, our being together was to me the sign that it was appropriate that we were we were two parts however remote of this society of this life one was sensuous and life-loving it seemed while in the center of it there was a darkness and a tragedy that I didn't know the dimensions of at that time uh, and the same thing was true of me so it wasn't that crazy. And yet, and then at a certain point, you decided, well, you, you fell in love, basically. Yes. After that first meeting, though, your first impulse, I think, was to escape, to resist. Uh, you write, you've written in the book, flying homeward, her scent still on my hands. I knew my innocence was technical, merely and the fact blackened my heart. But along with it came the certainty that I could, after all, lose myself in sensuality. In other words, you'd fallen head over heels in love, and... Uh... That's right. But at the beginning, why do you think she needed you? What drew her to you, do you think? First of all, I took her at her own evaluation, which uh, very few people did. I, I thought she was a very serious girl way back, uh, and uh, that she was struggling, I thought, because she generally was thought of as being a rather lightheaded, if not silly, human being. Uh, that's because I loved her, so I took that attitude toward her, and uh, so the best of her she thought was in my eye. Therefore, the hope she had was with me for that, for that time in her life. Many people patronized her. One feels even now, today, that she's still patronized. Yeah, something. she's a walking... Uh, uh, she's some kind of a uh, dancing bear or... A, that she shouldn't be able, for example, to have any interest in anything but uh, sex uh, showing off for... Uh, saying dopey things to the newspapers. But you, perhaps more than anyone, was, was were close to her for, during that period. Do you, can you describe what you refer to as the inevitability of her tragedy? Why did she have to struggle, do you think, in the way that she did? Uh, basically, her struggle was a psychological struggle against uh, abandonment, against abuse. In our terms today, she would have been thought of as an abused child. Uh, now, the psychological damage that that creates is very well known. And uh, she struggled in a lifetime and lost against that damage. That's fundamentally what, what it was. Uh, her mother condemned her. Her mother was uh, a 
mentally ill and uh, tried to destroy her at one point. And uh, she, it was also a question of a surrounding uh, uh, fundamentalist religion, which condemned exactly what she was doing, namely acting, being in show business. Uh, so that there was a stain of uh, the illicit and the condemnation always there at the same time. She was in rebellion when she acted, and she expected punishment as a result of it somewhere in that psyche. Uh, it's, there's a number of forces that were working for it, but many, some of them were particular to her, but uh, it's by no means an unheard of type. The, the great thing about her, uh, to me, was that the struggle was valiant. She was a very courageous human being. And uh, she didn't give up, really, I guess, till the end. The screenplay of The Misfits, based on Miller's own short story about three small-time horse traders in the Nevada desert, was motivated by his desire to write a film that would enhance Marilyn's opportunities as a performer. But by the time that John Huston came to direct the film in 1962, Miller's relationship with Monroe had broken down irretrievably, despite those occasional moments during shooting when they still appeared to be a couple. The circumstances of making that were, were difficult because that was just your last period. It was... Uh... She, uh, Marilyn was ill physically, uh, she was distraught psychologically, everything was coming to a crisis at the same time she was having to do the first dramatic role she'd ever tried to do. Uh, she was also in a crisis really with her, the, the way she was being managed by uh, Paul Strasberg. Uh, that too was, uh, everything was coming together in an explosion. So that the picture took months longer than it should have taken, and she was simply worn out, as anybody would be. We were shooting in 110 degree heat some days. It was a Turkish bath up there on that dry lake. Unbelievable. So, anyway, it was the end of our marriage, but uh, it was also a terrible physical time for her. It was precisely at that time, at this very difficult time, that you met Inga Morath, who has become your wife and who you've lived with ever since. Uh, she was, you met her on the set of The Misfits, didn't you, at that very moment? She was one of uh, several uh, photographers from Magnum Photos, which is a cooperative photographic agency in New York, who came out with uh, Cartier Bresson to photograph The Misfits. At that time, however, I had no time for her. Or I just was so absorbed in that movie and trying to keep myself afloat. But uh, we did meet there, and then I met her again some months later in New York. By this time, I, I was no longer with Marilyn. Look, if you start going under tonight, I'm calling the ambulance. I haven't the strength to go through this alone again. All the experiences of meeting Inga, the breakup with Marilyn and her later suicide, came together in a complicated dramatic form in After the Fall, a play which deals with the dilemma of personal responsibility. Then put that stuff away and go to sleep. Could you stay like five minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Remember how, how you used to talk to me till I, till I fell asleep? Oh, Maggie, I've sat beside you in darkened rooms for days and weeks on end. You lost patience with me. That's right, yes. So, you lied, right? Yes, I lied. Every day. We're all separate people. I tried not to be. But one finally is a separate person. I have to survive, too, honey. So... Are you going to put me? You talk over with your doctor. <laughs> if you loved me. Oh, yes, but how would you know, Maggie? Do you know any more who I am, aside from my name? 
A suicide kills two people, Maggie. That's what it's for. So I'm removing myself, and maybe it'll lose its point. Carrie! You based After the Fall on Camus' novel, The Fall, in which a man fails to save a woman from suicide. What made you change the dilemma of the, of the central character when you came to doing the play? Uh, it gradually began to occur to me, well, that's one dilemma, but what about the, supposing he had tried to save her? And supposing he'd saved her? He would now be confronted with a complicated human life of a woman who wanted to kill herself. What is his responsibility then? How does he relate to that responsibility? Because now he really has taken on the role of the man who saved her. He has put himself in the way of God. He rescued her from death. And uh, after the fall is involved with that, gradually, slowly, that idea, which I extrapolated into the whole Nazi experience, because uh, in the interval, I went through Germany for months with Inga, and uh, in those days, you could still walk among the concentration camps. They hadn't been cleaned up so as they have been now. And the whole question of one's relationship to the destroyed, to the people who finally get it in the face, uh, was also in that play. Uh, and it was the, after the fall, the play was an attempt to arrive at a real relationship with self-destruction. There were some people who thought that the play had rather unscrupulously traded on, on Marilyn's suicide. What was the general reaction of the public to after the fall? It was mostly ferocious. It, uh, it blew my image away for a lot of people. They hated me. And uh, I uh, uh, rationalized it anyway as being, uh, see, this is something you deny. You deny the murder in you. You deny the complicity with evil. That's why evil goes on. If we didn't deny, if we ceased to deny it and saw our own culpability, maybe it wouldn't be as prevalent. But uh, that's evil, we're good. But we don't do bad things. Uh, people did not want to be confronted with what is that play is saying. And that play is saying that uh, at a certain point, you are ready to sacrifice somebody. As the Jews were sacrificed in uh, Europe, as our uh, 58,000 men were sacrificed in Vietnam, as uh, who knows what every day of the week is not sacrificed by human beings who simply are tired of having the responsibility for them. Well, nobody wanted to hear that. Uh, they still don't want to hear it. They will never want to hear it. That's why the Bible goes on forever. Because that's what the Bible is telling you, if one only knew, that we're all connected.